So hello there and welcome to another tutorial. My name is Tanay Bakshi and today we're going to be going over the fourth episode in the Learn Deep Learning from Scratch series. Now today is a continuation of the previous episode where I'd shown you the number negator. Today we're going to be talking about what I like to call dimensionality reduction or really this is a generic term really in the industry. Um, but what we're going to be doing is we're actually going to be exploring dimensionality reduction through what's known as gradient descent. Now you've already seen an example of gradient descent in action with a number negator and today we're going to be taking a look at how you can actually repurpose that in order to reduce the number of dimensions in your data. Again, don't worry about what that means just yet. I'll be showing that to you in just a moment. So let's go ahead and dive right into the example. All right, now what you're seeing on screen is a two-dimensional graph. It's kind of similar to the one that I had shown you last time, except I just sort of expanded the graph a little bit. Uh, now let's just say I were to give you a pretty challenging task. We've got the following three-dimensional coordinates, A, B, C, and D. All right, so these are four different points in three-dimensional space. And I want you to plot them on this two-dimensional graph. How would you do it? Well, you can't. <laughs> They're three-dimensional points. You fundamentally cannot just represent three dimensions in two-dimensional space. It doesn't really make sense. Now, there are some ways you could do it, right? Like you could, you know, cast a shadow of a three-dimensional object on a two-dimensional space. There are different things you could do. Um, however, being able to sort of represent the same structure of points from three-dimensional space into two-dimensional space is what's known as dimensionality reduction. Removing an entire dimension from a certain sequence of points or some sort of data that you have. Now, this might not seem extremely useful immediately, but think about it like this. Let's just say you're dealing with images of, you know, cats and dogs, and you use a neural network to bring down uh, the number of image or the number of numbers that you need to work with, which, you know, for a 4K image could be, you know, thousands of different um, numbers. Let's just say you use a neural network to bring that down to just 512, which is totally reasonable. Now, the thing is, we live in a universe with just three spatial dimensions, and we physically cannot perceive what 512 spatial dimensions would be like. And therefore, those values aren't very important to you. You can't really make sense of them. So you've got to do what's known as dimensionality reduction to bring them down to, you know, what we as mere mortals can actually comprehend, which is just three or fewer spatial dimensions. In this case, though, I've given you something a little bit simpler, which is we go from three dimensions to two dimensions so we can plot it more easily on this graph. Now, there's a couple of ways we could go about doing this, and here's the way that I've decided we'll do it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take each pair of points, so for example, A, B, A, C, A, D, then B, C, and C, D, and, and so on, and I'm going to take all these different um, coordinate pairs, and we're going to find the distance of every point to every other point. Then we're going to try and map those distances to a bunch of 2D coordinates where the distances are preserved as much as possible. But how do we find 2D coordinates where the distances between all of them match the distances between A, B, C, and D? Well, let's figure it out. Now, of course, just with like a lot of things in life, we're going to start off with a pretty random initialization. So let's just say we've got these four points and we want these to now represent A, B, C, and D. Now, these are starting off at completely random locations, right? It doesn't matter uh, where they are right now. Uh, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to somehow move these dots to where I know they represent a similar structure to what A, B, C, and D do in three-dimensional space. The way I'm going to do this is by drawing a line between all of them, right? So there's lines going between all the different dots now. And what I'm going to do is I'm also going to plot out on the bottom right corner for you a little bit of a legend, all right? Now, each line is color-coded, and for every line, you can see two values in the bottom right. One is Y, and one is Y hat. Now, the Y, which is the one on the right, is the actual distance between those two points in three-dimensional space. So this is the actual, like, label for how far away we know these points are supposed to be. So, for example, you know, red, uh, 7.3, we know that whatever two points red is connecting, their actual distance in three-dimensional space is 7.3 units. And this is Euclidean straight line distance. However, y hat is what we believe their distance is. It is what we have sort of set their distance to be 
in two-dimensional space. So if you were to take the actual dots on the graph right now, if you were, if you were to calculate their, uh, their distance, you would get 5.7. Now, here's what we want to do. We want to move all these dots across this space such that y hat matches y as much as possible, meaning where those dots are, their distances to each other match the distances uh, between all of the three-dimensional dots as well. And we're going to do this with the power of gradient descent. We're going to use an extremely similar algorithm to what I've already shown you uh, with, the, with the number negator. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate all the different distance values, which in this case, there are six of them, right? So I'm going to take all six distance values, and I'm going to find the mean squared error of the predicted distance values against what we know the distance values should be. All right, now, what is mean squared error? I just pulled that, uh, pulled that explanation out of nowhere. Uh, and what, what does that mean? Well, if we go back to our code for just a moment, you can actually see that over here, what I'm doing is I'm technically getting an error all right, which is the distance between the output that we expected and the actual prediction from the perceptron. So I'm getting the error and then I'm squaring it. So we can call this sort of function here, the squared error function. Uh, however, remember though, that when we're dealing with this more sort of complex graph environment, we don't just have one error, right? It's not just we're dealing with 5.7 versus 7.3, we're dealing with 5.7, 7.3, and 3.2, 4.9, and 2.8, 5.2, and so on and so forth. We have six different error values to deal with, six different squared errors. So what I'm going to do is to find the final squared error, I'm going to take all of the individual squared errors, which is just, you know, y hat minus y squared squared, we can take all of them and get the average value, so the mean value, uh, which is basically just going to be summing up all the square errors and dividing by six because that's how many errors there are. Then when I do that, that sort of adds up to be a single function that I can then sort of find a derivative through with respect to the coordinate values that are on screen right now, and I can optimize those coordinate values to make it so that the squared and mean squared error is lower, meaning y hat matches y better. So let's actually take a look at that in action. Now I'm going to do this iteration by iteration. When I go ahead and calculate the gradient for the first time, the movement looks a little bit like this. So in this case, what I did was I went ahead and found that mean squared error, I found the gradient, and I found it with respect to all of the different dots on screen, and I moved those dots uh, to reduce the value of the mean squared error function. Again, to make it so y hat matches y as best as possible. As you can see, there are a couple of things that have started to match up. Uh, the yellow line, for example, uh, 5 is pretty close to 5.2. The blue line is pretty much exactly there. It's 4.1 to 4.1. Um, the green line at the very end is 1.9 to 1.7. So it's starting to get close, but there's still a lot of error. So for example, red is 9.5 to 7.3. Um, and so there is still a lot of error. That means we need to run more iterations of gradient descent to move the value of the function lower and lower. So let's just say we run another iteration. So we kind of went back more closely to what the initial starting point was. But as you can see, we're starting to get y hat to be closer to what y is. We move move out again, and we do more and more iterations until finally gradient descent says that, well, you know, it's a low enough value. Now, technically, gradient descent is never the one saying, you know, we should stop now. As long as you keep, you know, querying the gradient function, it'll keep giving you a value. You just want to stop optimizing when you believe, you know, what we're good enough now uh, to have a satisfactory answer. In this case, we ended up getting the following distances. Um, so we got 7.6 to 7.3, 4.7, 4.9. So as you can see, they're all pretty close. Um, there's some that are pretty much exact. So for example, the white line, 5.1. You know, it's pretty much there. Green, 1.8, 1.7, pretty much there. And then there are some that are a little bit more off. Things like the yellow line at 4.9 to 5.2. And you're probably wondering, well, why are they still so off if we just did that whole optimization procedure? And well, the answer is pretty simple. It's because we're trying to fundamentally represent more information in a space where we can only represent a lot less information. Now, we can never really, 
or not never, I'm gonna catch myself there, it's not never, but there are a lot of cases where three-dimensional space or the structures that we create in three-dimensional space cannot be perfectly represented in two-dimensional space. And the reason for that is because fundamentally we are chopping off a whole dimension. We are losing a lot of space in which to, in which to store information. And therefore, we can always get close when we reduce the number of dimensions in something, but we can almost never really get exactly there. Now, if you were to run an optimi optimization procedure for you know, hundreds more iterations, or if you were to use a slightly better procedure, which we'll talk about later, then you might be able to get this even closer. But generally, the dots that you're seeing on screen right now are a good representation of that 3D structure in 2D space. So while it might not be perfect, it's really close. <laughs> and so if you're trying to, uh, you know, for example, take these three-dimensional uh, dots and you don't have a plotting library that can deal with three-dimensional graphs and you want to reduce them to two dimensions but still keep the general theme of the dots, uh, then, you know, this is this is a good solution to, to go about doing that. Uh, now, of course, this is... Um, invariant to where the dots actually are on the grid. Um, you know, it really just matters about the distances between the individual dots themselves. And so uh, you don't need to worry about, you know, that specific detail, but really what this means is that this technique that I'm showing you over here um, is going to help you reduce the number of dimensions in your data. And we do that by using the power of gradient descent. Once again, let me make this completely clear. If we take a look at the graph for a moment once more, the general idea of what we're doing is we're taking all of the coordinates, we're finding their distances to each other, then we're finding the distances between all of the actual coordinates in 3D space, right? So that's y hat and y respectively, y hat being our dots and y being the actual dots in 3D space. We are finding the mean squared error between those two sets of distances, and then we're finding the derivative of that whole error function with respect to the actual coordinates in 2D space. And by finding that gradient, we can optimize those coordinates to put them in places where the distances match up best. And so that is dimensionality reduction. And of course, though, today is all about code. So I'm going to show you how you can actually implement this technique as well using Google Colab. Let's take a look. This one is a little bit more code heavy, but it's not that bad. And I'll show you what I mean. Uh, now to start off, of course, we're doing a couple of pretty standard imports. Um, and so I'm just importing the matplotlib library so we can actually plot out uh, the data that we end up getting. Um, I'm importing TensorFlow, which is you know that new, that new library that we're using. Um, and I'm also importing a, a framework called sklearn or scikit-learn. Uh, specifically, I'm going to be using their datasets module because using the datasets module, I can load in a dataset known as the iris dataset. Now, the iris dataset is incredibly popular. Um, it's a dataset that contains 150 attributes, uh, or not 150 attributes, um, 150 instances of flowers. And each instance contains four measurements of the flowers themselves, right? So things like the petal, um, pe things like petal length and, and width, uh, same thing for the se uh, sepal. And what the, what the dataset really aims to do is it aims to sort of provide researchers with this dataset um, where they can build algorithms that take those four attributes and try to predict is this flower uh, or, or which one of the three species does this flower come from, right? So each uh, individual sample represents one species of a flower. Uh, there are three different species in the dataset, 50 samples for each, 150 samples total. Uh, and so basically the idea is, can we build some kind of machine learning model to take those four attributes in and spit out a prediction of which species the flowers, the flower in this case, belongs to? Uh, now, it's a little bit more difficult than you might initially think. Um, because it's very easy to tell one of the species against two of the others, but then those other two species are really difficult to sort of tell between each other. Uh, and I'll be showing you what I mean by that today, and then in the next episode we'll take a look at how we can fix that issue.
But for now, let's actually take a look at working with the Iris data set. Now, the first thing that I go ahead and do uh, is I go ahead and load in what's known as the Iris data set. So we've already talked about what Iris is, and I load that into a variable called Iris. Um, then what I do is I take the data element of the Iris data set, so the actual like, you know, 150 instances of four features each, and load them into a variable called X, and I convert that to a list. Um, now, we're doing something called a target as well, but don't worry about that just yet. We'll come back to that code eventually. Uh, for now, all you need to care about is X. Uh, now, just to sort of give you an idea of, of what the state is like, the shape of the X array is currently 154. That means that we have 150 arrays where each array is, another, is actually another array of four values each. Um, and so, again, 150 instances of different flowers, and for each instance, uh, there are four different, um, four different attributes. Now, here's the thing about this data set. It's really pushing us as humans to the limits of what we can physically perceive. As I mentioned, we live in three spatial dimensions, not four. And so we can never really just plot out this iris data set because it doesn't make sense to. Um, instead, what we have to do is we have to run the same dimensionality reduction technique that I talked about in order to reduce those dimensions down to two or three. But in this case, we're doing two. And the way I do that is I start off by defining something called a batching function. What I do in the batching function is pretty simple. I create three new lists, A, B, and C. Then what I do is 64 times, I actually choose two completely random elements from the actual data set, so two different flowers at complete random. Then I take the first flower, put it in A, I take the second flower, I put it in B, and then I take the Euclidean distance between the two flowers and put it in C. And so this Euclidean distance is, by, is found by getting the square root of the sum of the squared differences in the actual coordinate values. So each coordinate value, you get the difference, you square those differences, you get the sum of those whole differences and you get the square root of that sum, and then you've got straight line distance. Then what I do is I go ahead and take each one of those arrays, A, B, and C, convert them all to TensorFlow tensors, and then return those three values from the batch function. Then what I do is I create something called a weight. Now this weight is just a, a tensor filled with random values. The shape of this tensor is 4, 2. Now, why exactly do we have this? Well, it's because we're going to be running what's known as a matrix multiplication of the actual input iris data set against this weight in order to get the dimension reduced output, uh, in order to get the, um, the versions of those coordinates in two-dimensional space instead of four-dimensional space. So the input is four, the output is two. Now, that's a very simplified representation of a weight. Um, and so in case you do not know how matrix multiplication works, there will be a website linked in the description below describing um, through an animation how exactly matrix multiplication works. But for now, all you need to know is that weight is what we multiply the iris flower by in order to get its two-dimensional representation. And if we get a better version of this weight, then we get a better two-dimensional representation of the four-dimensional input. Then what I do is actually pretty similar to the number negator. Watch. What I do is I go ahead and take the two inputs, which would be you know, the first set of coordinates and the second set of coordinates, as well as the distances between them, from the batch function earlier. Then I create a gradient tape and I tell the tape to watch the weight. Then what I do is I go ahead and run the matrix multiplication of the first set of coordinates against the weight and the second set of coordinates against the weight. Then what I do is I use tensorflow functions in order to find the Euclidean distances of all of those different, um, of all those different um, individual coordinate pairs. And again, I do this by getting the difference, I do it by squaring it, then getting the sum, and then finally by square rooting. All right. Now, the reason I fed in a one here was in order to get the sum along the axis of the actual coordinates and not just the sum of the whole array, including, you know, across the different coordinate pairs. Uh, now, then what I do is I go ahead and take the distance that we calculated and, of course, the actual distance that we expected from the batch. I go ahead and get the difference, square it and get the mean. So this is the mean squared error like so. 
All right, then I find the gradient of that loss with respect to the weight. I modify the weight just so that it you know, moves in the better direction so that we can actually map that four-dimensional coordinate to a two-dimensional coordinate better. And then I print out the loss just so I know how well my little, uh, little weight is doing. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and actually run this code for you. So let's just say I go ahead and run this code from the very beginning. It's gonna go ahead and connect to a brand new collab environment. I'm gonna go ahead and initialize my weight, run this, and as you can see, slowly but surely, our loss value continues to decrease. If I scroll all the way up in the output here, you can see the loss actually starts off at a pretty high value. It starts off, you know, in the 0 0.8 and the 1s, but then slowly the loss value gets lower and lower and lower, meaning the weight is better and better, meaning that the individual distances between points in two-dimensional space is closer to the distances between the points in four-dimensional space. And Guess what? What I can do is actually run a little bit of matplotlib code, and I can actually plot out that two-dimensional data that we just created with the help of matplotlib. All I've got to do is take all of the input data, convert it to a TensorFlow tensor, and then multiply, or we'll do a matrix multiplication, of the, all that input data against the weight to convert it from four dimensions to two, and then I convert that to a NumPy array, Use a little bit of logic to actually go ahead and have matplotlib plot out in a scatter plot those two dimensions and then show the plot. Now, what I also did is I made it so that for every dot that represents species one, two, or three, I would have it put that dot in red, green, or blue color respectively. And you can actually see through this plot that as you can see, the red one is very easy to distinguish between the other two. It's very far away. Um, but then you've got green and blue that sort of touch each other. There are certain points that are in this ambiguous area where you don't really know if they're green or if they're blue. Um, and that's a bit of an issue for neural networks to deal with, but we'll be fixing it in the next episode of Learn Deep Learning from Scratch. Now, I know that this was a lot to digest. All of the code will be in the description. And of course, if there are any questions, please do feel free to ask me. And I may go ahead and also um, clarify these examples a little bit more, go into a little bit more detail in the beginning of the next video as well. But overall, though, I do hope you enjoyed. Thank you very much for joining in today. Uh, once again, if you do enjoy this kind of content, please do make sure to subscribe to the channel. It really does help out a lot. And also make sure to like the video if you did enjoy it. Once again, would love to answer your questions down in the comments below. Apart from that, thank you very much everyone for joining in today and goodbye.